Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in 1 Corinthians, verse by verse. This will be somewhat of a special video, an unusual type video. I'm going to just talk to you face to face, uh, more from really the heart uh, than the text, even though it's much more important than anything I have to say. But many Christians are hurting today, and most needlessly. These same believers were overflowing with abundant joy in the Lord during the early days of their Christian lives. Perhaps you can relate to that, but something happened. What could possibly have happened to cause such a change in the lives of so many people? I want to talk a little bit about that. I hope that in this video that somehow uh, this, this video will address that sad situation along with the people and the circumstances and, and all of the error that caused such harm and ruin. There is no way really that one video uh, can cover all of the problems uh, and solutions for this tragic problem. However, I do believe that it can introduce the hurting Christian to the truth and the provision that God has waiting for him. I want to say from the very outset that there are no magic cures, no shortcuts for the treatment of a despondent Christian life. But I do believe with everything that's in me that our Bible, that which we call the Word of God, it does offer the real solution. And so for many Christians, this solution has brought speedy, dramatic changes. It's brought dramatic results. But for others, it's no greater time was involved. But should any one of you out there who's hurting, should any born-again believer in Christ truly consider what I'm about to tell you in this video, uh, if you truly consider what is said, I believe that you can be assured that your life will never be the same again. It's not because of these, these are my words, but because the very truths that I hope to present are founded in Scripture. I believe that the Holy Spirit will honor that. I believe that the Holy Spirit will make sure of that. All spiritual growth leads the hungry Christian farther into the Word of God and praise His name, ever greater involvement into the very life of Christ Himself. So my prayer is that His plan will be increasingly accomplished in your life starting this very hour. There's an incalculable number of Christians who are attending church desiring to be fed only to walk away weakened and more hungry than ever. And this condition was foreseen by our Lord Jesus Christ and instruction was given by Him to feed my lambs, to shepherd my sheep, to feed my sheep. And this condition is inexcusable for any church today, any ministry. There are yet countless others who attend church out of a sense of commitment and obligation. Now, that may seem like a commendable motive for church attendance, but I assure you it is not. Compulsion, is, the, folks, is the very heart of the law, and law brings death. The only motive for attending church or any Bible study or anything else should be the response of life seeking other life, our life seeking other believers to mutually edify, to share and receive, and to return praise and worship to the source of life Himself. We know that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8.1. 1. 
our approval, our acceptance uh, by God, from God, is only because we are accepted in the beloved Ephesians 1.6. And yet a vast number, and I mean a vast number, of Christians are living in abject frustration. And the Lord is about ready to return, I believe. They've discovered a number of passages in their Bible where that they feel contradictions exist with other scriptures. And this tension causes frustration and a complete lack of interest in Bible study altogether. Now, perhaps you don't personally have that problem, yet you still cannot seem to have victory in applying its teachings to your life. That may be you. If so, this video is for you. Does your Bible seem to be a tough manual of instructions that's impossible to follow? And throughout it all, does God appear to not be alive in your experience? And what about faith? Does faith seem to be beyond your grasp and far from reassuring right now? Even though you believe He's coming soon. Are you finding fulfillment in everyone or everything other than Christ? Are you trying to walk in His shoes only to find out that the size is just much too large? Our lives are not a series of struggles to become acceptable to God. If that is what you believe, then it's possible through your misdirected attempts to discover the key to effective Christian living that you have forgotten why that you ever accepted Christ in the first place. Sadder yet, perhaps you never knew why you accepted Him at all. Now, should any of that describe your present Christian life, your present Christian experience, please do not be troubled. The simplicity of Christ in you is what changes Christian lives. If you find yourself struggling in meaningless, self-defeating Christian activities, just know that God has you right there for a purpose, that He's working to draw you into an understanding of who you are in Him. Jesus is our life. He is not our example. I know that's probably what you've heard a lot. There's a difference. Attempting to walk in His shoes might seem to be a commendable goal, yet in reality it's a fruitless one. It will never work. You need to reverse your thinking. He wants to walk in your shoes. Not I, but Christ. Galatians 2.20 I, Personally, I find it incredible how that His order gets so easily reversed in the believer's life. How in the world did you ever get to this place when you started out so well? Just when did you first realize that your new, exciting life in Christ had lost some of its joy? What really happened to cause you to end up feeling so confused, depressed, hurt, feeling unworthy, defeated? Well, the answer lies in those early days of your new life in Christ. I want you to think back. Remember when the teachings of Jesus were hurled at you as though you were an enemy of God? Were you indicted for your failure to live up to all the Bible said that the righteous must do to enter into His kingdom? You know, and how about the worship services at your church? Did you find yourself feeling guilty that you didn't give as much as, as the others gave You know, when they passed around the offering plate? Did you try to shrink down into your pew whenever a call came from the pulpit to, for workers to serve in the church? And just how spiritual did you feel when you were called upon to read one verse from the Bible and you couldn't find You couldn't even find the, the chapter or, the, or even the book. Or perhaps your pages were stuck together. And how about those home Bible studies? You know, all those prayer groups... Uh, praying for each other. How much joy in the Lord did you sense when others would pray that the Lord lead you to, to do what you really ought to be doing or, or for Him to lead you to quit doing you know, those things that you really shouldn't be doing or couldn't stop doing? 
did you feel that you measured up to their opinion of what a good Christian should look and act like? Or how about the night some fiery evangelist asked for a show of hands of all those who had led someone to the Lord and you couldn't raise your hand? Then just how guilty did you feel when you knew that you had let your Lord down? Oh, and what about that horrible sin against the Holy Ghost? Had you committed that? Are you beginning to, to see how that you got to the place that, where you are now? I just want to ask you one question. Let me ask you just how much of that pressure was brought into your life by the Lord Himself? Well, you should have said none. The truth is, many Christians are in a conflict that they cannot themselves overcome. And this grave conflict is that vain struggle of the self-life that becomes frustrated and fails. What is this self? Well, the self is all that we are and we have been from the time of our physical birth until our new birth in Christ. Self is the old man the sin nature, the flesh, the old self. In fact, everything about us that opposes the will and the work of God in and through our lives because it seeks to improve a believer's standing before God by what it can do in and of itself. And sadly today, most well-intentioned believers are unaware of the very existence of the self-life within Yet coming to a biblical understanding of the self-life inside us can promise and secure rest for the most weary, defeated believer. Dearly beloved, there, there can be little genuine spiritual growth in the life of the believer until he's able to receive what Scripture says about law and self. Self has positively no righteous function in the Christian's life. But there is an answer to the travesty of self. And that answer is the person of Jesus Christ. Because what He does is He actually takes the sincere heart through this painful, struggling process in order to expose self's uselessness and then later grants that believer rest. So He hasn't abandoned you. Surely the believer's greatest difficulty is in realizing that self is an utter failure when it outwardly appears to possess such potential. You know, I mean, few things seem to attack sound reasoning more than for one to advocate that a believer not exercise self-effort. I mean, after all, shouldn't a Christian try the best that he possibly can? I mean, isn't he to, to put out more effort when he's not doing good enough? I mean, surely everybody would agree that practice makes perfect, right? Well, folks, the, these seeming truisms may seem logical to the natural reasoning, but they do not, they absolutely do not apply to the Christian life. Self seeks to improve something that cannot be improved. A fallen and a sinful nature that can do nothing but fail, that is the very essence of self. That nature cannot be improved upon, nor can it ever be perfected. God is not cleaning up the flesh. He's not working to clean up the old man. Self is that hideous entity within us that by its dominating, domineering nature, it prohibits the new creation in Christ from expressing itself. But when self is discovered and put in its rightful place on the cross where it belongs, then struggling and frustration subside. Only upon discovering the true nature of the self-life can we come to experience victory over sin, cultivate appropriate desires toward service, and then gain rest within our very soul. Dearly beloved, Scripture is not just a book of instructions on how to live the Christian life, but is primarily the revelation of the person and the work of our beloved Redeemer, Jesus Christ. 
if you're hoping if you're hoping to be better or acceptable then you fail to see yourself in Christ only if you're constantly being disappointed with yourself then you are believing in yourself and to be discouraged is unbelief as to God's purpose and plan of blessing for your life and of course to be proud is to be blind because we don't have any standing before God in our in and of ourselves and to preach devotion first and blessing second is to reverse God's order and preach law, not grace. If all you hear day after day, week after week, is someone, whether they're in the pulpit or on YouTube or wherever, someone badgering you to try harder, there can be little doubt but what your understanding of the Christian life is being twisted and perverted and distorted. You didn't begin your life in Christ with garbage like that. Just why was it that your early Christian life was devoid of all that harmful nonsense? Because you at least, it's, to some degree, you realized that you couldn't save yourself, that you needed Christ. Being crucified with Christ, you died to all the requirements of the law, self, Satan, sin, and the world. Your present trouble didn't begin until others began to heap responsibilities upon you which you were never equipped, required, or intended to carry. So, slowly, you began to use your old self to try and accomplish the impossible demands that others required of you. You failed just as Israel did. Then soon, before you knew it, you were back under the full dominion of law and self that died with Christ at Calvary. The entire epistle to the Galatians was written to address the very problem that I'm describing in this video, where we are feasting on Christ in 1 Corinthians, where we see God's grace poured out in, in abundance on a church that was about as immature as any fellowship of Christians can possibly be. specific problem at Galatia was the introduction of circumcision law into the church for salvation where the Holy Spirit addresses any activity or practice that would would have a believer either gain or maintain righteousness on a human level we're talking about righteousness folks if any righteousness comes by the law that is performing a given standard or requirement then Christ died needlessly. Galatians has been used heavily due to its clear and graphic statements concerning law and self and self-effort versus the Christ life. And today, here we are near to the Lord returning for us and the shameful condition remains that few, if any, pulpits or anyone else is warning people of the lethal danger of self in the law and as a result most Christians are now living in spiritual adultery are you one of those have you accepted Christ as your Savior great I hope you have but I hope that you haven't stopped there you desperately need to have him as your life as your Savior he became your sin he took your all of your sin upon himself and your Redeemer, but that was only one half of His great design for your life. When you were born again, it was essential that you clearly understood that the sin issue was forever entirely dealt with, put to rest. Yet now, and just as important, it's crucial that you understand how the issues of practical and positional righteousness apply to your new life. God put all of your sin on Christ, then He put the righteousness of Christ on you. Many believers have no understanding of these marvelous truths. Rather, they live torturous lives of exerting fantastic efforts, and I mean fantastic efforts, to try to, to work out their own righteousness for Christ. Sad but true, there are those who acknowledge that they possess His righteousness, yet they continue to live their lives in a state of spiritual adultery. They just falsely assume that Enough has already been done in their positional standing before God. 
they erroneously conceived their Christian lives complete because their sins were removed and Christ's righteousness bestowed. They could not be further from the truth. The Christian life and growth process is never going to be completed in this lifetime. You know, for a Christian to stop growing is for that Christian to die. As our present study has shown us, if you follow us along in these series of videos, the condition of living in spiritual adultery is the atrocity of being a spouse to Christ while having an endless affair with the law. Christ is the end of the law to those who believe on Him as their life. If you're a spouse to Christ, then you must not flirt with attempts to accomplish your own righteousness. It was through the obedience of Christ that you became righteous. At that time, the sum total of all your sin was dealt with by Christ. Therefore, you can never become any more sinful or any less righteous by what you yourself do. You are, beloved, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And a serious problem develops when a Christian tries to cover the symptom of his sin nature through empty, frustrated efforts to produce a righteousness that's of ourselves. Should you attempt to do this, you'll fail to recognize your position in Christ, who you are, who you really are in Christ. This is why our text is going to tell us. We're going to see as we study through this chapter that all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. Not all things are profitable. We have to leave the direction of God's sanctifying work up to Him. Resting in that area where God's working in our lives it leaves us with the anxious expectation of good and godly characteristics surfacing in our daily walk. But a strange phenomenon occurs in the life of the new believer in Christ. Precious little time passes from when he was on his knees. He was declaring his total bankruptcy of, of righteousness, his worth, self-worth and ability until well, he's storming the throne of heaven asking God what He can do for him. I mean, amazing. Just shortly before, he had nothing to offer God, and now he assumes that his nothingness is the fulfillment of God's need. Service is, is the life of Jesus flowing out of us to others. His life through us serves others rather than our lives serving others for Him. Our service must come out of our new nature, not the old whereby He performs the vine, performs the righteous service through the branch. All we can present anyone is the manifestation of the old self with all its garbage, all its depraved intentions and methods. However, Christ has everything to offer and is fully competent to accomplish it in true righteousness. Just as in all other areas of Christian life, service springs forth from truth. Sanctify them in truth, thy word is truth. Therefore, if we haven't come into a personal understanding of, of truth, we'll continue to struggle, we'll continue to be confused as to what God desires our lives be while we're here. And we take with us what we have now. Jesus came to give us life. He came to give it more abundantly. It's out of this abundance that our service is supplied with authenticity, we don't want them to see a crass manifestation of, of self. We want our audience to, to witness Him, hear the Holy Spirit. He's our life. He's our message. Ministry apart from His life is merely a ministry from self. Our Lord said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Once truth has been learned, received, applied in our lives, the temptation however, is to rely upon the sheer force of that dynamic truth rather than the Holy Spirit imparting the life of Christ. Our privilege is to offer Christ to the needy, both saved and unsaved, preach nothing but Christ and Him crucified, 
and trust that God, the Holy Spirit, will, will do the full work of convincing them of their need for Him. Or as the Apostle Paul said, let us therefore, as many as are perfect, are mature, have this attitude, and if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. And of course, not that we're adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the surpassing greatness of the power may be of God and not from ourselves. And this all results in what we call worship. You know, the essence of true worship is returning to God a true estimation and honor for who He is and, and what He's done. The only way that we can know what He's done is through this book. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. God is spirit, not a spirit, spirit. And until we are freed from the false objects of worship to the true, we'll be held back in our most intimate area of spiritual growth, worship. We worship Him for who He is, for what He's done in our lives, is doing, and will do. And as the Holy Spirit continues to illumine His Word to you, grant you faith to believe Him concerning it, and then give a test to try the substance of that faith, that faith changes your life. True faith always has the faithfulness of God as its object. Never does genuine worship have a contrived man-made opinion of God, only that which is stated in His Word to be true of Him. And when that test is over, the believer remains steadfast, and worship is the only possible, natural, new nature response, and everything else is of the old man. Nothing that we make up about Him produces true worship, only that of which He reveals of Himself. We worship God for all that He has done in our lives, all that He's presently doing, and all that He will in the future do. If that's all we did was worship Him for that, we wouldn't have time to do anything else, folks. His great, His great work is our focus, not ours. False praise. Well, that turns the believer to look away from their Savior, to look at their own carnal self. We, we praise Him for what He's he's doing in our lives now right at the present time but you know unfortunately many of us have been encouraged to just praise him for the pleasant things you know the good things that occur in our lives yet yet in all truth all circumstances are praiseworthy for the christian there is no tragedy in the christian's life when we exercise the ability he's given us to praise him through all the events of our lives it becomes possible for the truths of trusting and resting to remain functional in our walk. Praise for our current condition fully acknowledges the truth that God truly does work all things for the good for those who love God and are called according to His purpose. And so godly contentment is the result and that is what we want. It's what we all want. False praise, which is always looking for a, a material benefit, usually. It just can't produce those results ever. We praise Him for what He's doing through our lives, in and for others. Worship and praise for His perfect work done in others' lives through us. That functions as a buffer to diminish the thoughts which claim that His perfect work is ours. You know. This involvement in true worship cancels out any thought of self-accomplishment. When lives are being changed right before your eyes by His ministry through you, let me tell you, the temptation to look towards yourself and attribute His success as though it were your own is tremendous. It can be tremendous. Of course, we know self-pride is a horrid monster in praise folks, relegates that self to the cross where he belongs. And of course, the general Christian world, uh, I, gotta, so, so, this is, I gotta be careful here, but they, they kind of add to the problem without realizing it. You know, just as you think that your attitudes are being kept in a proper perspective, 
been many well-intentioned praises are heaped upon you by others in the Lord. Uh, these flattering praises are exactly what self wants to hear and demands that you believe them all. You know, an instant uh, response in either silent or vocal praise makes short work of that pride. The full work of Jesus Christ is in reality endless. However, we, we have revelations concerning some of its benefits for our lives. These are most of what he said to be true of every born-again believer. I've posted this in years past. I've posted this several times to the internet. Uh, we've, been, uh, we've been redeemed. We've been reconciled. We've been regenerated, justified, forgiven, born again, accepted, sealed, cleansed, chosen, indwelt, saved, sanctified, transformed, adopted, made a new cre cre creation in Christ. We've been delivered, made a joint heir in Christ. We've been seated in the heavenlies, hidden with Christ in God. We've been made a citizen of heaven. We've been given eternal life, propitiated, given the very righteousness of God in Christ. We've been granted great and special promises. We've been made a conqueror, made to stand. We've been joined to the body of Christ. We've been gifted. We've been sealed. We've been granted full assurance. We've been made a son of God, given peace, given mercy, loved by God, given understanding, given free access to God. Oh, my dearly beloved, what appears to be, I, I, it's, it almost leaves me speechless. So as far as the self goes, what appears to be holy and good is in fact can be an instrument of death in our spiritual walk. To live by law is spiritual adultery and death. In very simple terms, the cure for all of our problems, all our disillusionment, uh, disillusionment, our frustration, failure, it can be summed up in two words, Jesus Christ. I mean, any cure requires a removal of the infected areas of the body that impedes that health and such is the case for spiritual cures as well. But folks, God is the only person that's qualified to do that. He's the only one qualified to say what has to go or be abandoned in the believer's life. Not me, not anyone else. In other words, if not careful, I can put you people under law in an effort to get you under grace, which is kind of, it's kind of stupid and funny both at the same time. We always have to be on guard against that, but it would be wrong for me to not tell you that. And some of these provisions of which we desperately need to rest in are His gift of righteousness in us. His timing for all the events of our lives his, and His level of growth for us at any given time, any given time. And resting in Him allows us full contentment and peace concerning the progress of our lives in Him during any given phase of growth. Such peace and joy in the Holy Spirit permits us to fasten our eyes upon Him and not on our own impatient discontentment over our seemingly slow progress. We're going along at His pace, folks. I sincerely hope that by now something's begun to dawn in your understanding concerning the cure for Christian despondency. Can you, can you somehow see that the cure is in actuality nothing more than the traits that normally show up in a, in a person's life who has his life? These are not things to do to become normal in your Christian walk. They are the normal Christian walk. So just how to, does all this help you who are hurting so desperately? Well, once you've understood your symptoms, your, your means of infection, what caused it, uh, and the cure, then you can depend upon the great physician for treatment. Quite simply, your exposure to his truth will provide you with several options you didn't formerly have. You know, first, you're no longer in the dark as to what went wrong. And this allows him to work in your life through truth to empower you to refuse the prompting of others to become enslaved again to the law.
Uh, perhaps uh, now you become increasingly more aware of the deadly, defeating element of the self-life within. God will also honor that truth of His and He'll increasingly make you more sensitive to self's enslaving influence. In fact, He'll bring numerous trials in your life that make self flare up and show its true nature. And you're not going to like that. But God does that, and He does that for a reason. You know, perhaps from this day on, it'll, it's my prayer anyway that our Lord will faithfully make you aware of just who it is that's being manifest during those times. And perhaps now with greater frequency, you'll start seeing the pages of Scripture that teach on law begin to pop off of the page at you. And you won't be able to avoid the reality that law has absolutely no place in the believer's life as a standard for personal effort in obtaining righteous accomplishments. The Holy Spirit will increasingly lead you to be disgusted at the slightest suggestion that you return to law. The safeguarding of your living relationship with Christ will become as vital as protecting the earthly family that you love. You will ever increasingly view the attempts by others to place you or those that you love and have been entrusted to, to, to guide, to feed, to shepherd under law as what it really is, an assassination attempt on our spiritual life in Christ. And finally, your exposure to these elements of the sound Christian life will be used to God to place His desire in you to want these characteristics in your own life. Dearly beloved, you do not have to do them, for there isn't a single one that you can do. Why is that? Why is that so? Because they are characteristics of His life. Our human being cannot produce the divine. Deity produces the divine. But this exposure may allow you to be receptive rather than resistant when He places these desires within your heart. In closing, my prayer for those of you who have been so spiritually abused is that our Lord Jesus Christ will cover your sore and your open wounds of spiritual abuse with the calm, soothing, healing balm of Himself and that you come to Him, that you may have life and that more abundantly. This is Steve. Thank you for listening.